Well, good morning again, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone in person here in Invermere, in person up in Golden, and everybody online for this Sunday service for February 19th. We'll go through the announcements as we normally do, and our first slide is just that uh, appreciation for your financial gifts to the churches, and uh, I know it's kind of difficult to do that in this day and age, but thank you for going out of your way if you can in however you do it um, to financially support the church. And so our upcoming Sunday message givers, um, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent and I'll be giving the message or leading the service then. And then the second Sunday of Lent, Reverend Ross Smiley, who spoke with us last fall, he's going to be giving the message. Then I'm on March 12th, Al Dunlop is March 19th, and then I'm March 26th. We remember the Mission and Service Fund and the PWRDF Fund. Both funds have been supporting uh, the uh, emergency situation in Syria and Turkey, and um, we can continue to support them. Every Friday morning, we have a, a group of people that gather online to listen to Eckhart Tolle. It's a spiritual time. Uh, it's a meditative time, and uh, it's a time of gaining self-awareness. And so. We listen to talks by Eckert and we have some time for discussion. If you'd like to give that a try, uh, please let me know and I can send you the link. And we started last Wednesday, our first book's discussion about the, the book, The Gift of Years, Growing Older Gracefully. And so I hope all of you who aren't part of the study will notice that the, the, those who are part of the study start to grow older gracefully. Like I hope you notice it. So this coming Wednesday um, is our second gathering online, either from 1 to 2.30 in the afternoon or 7 to 8.30 in the evening. And we're going to be looking at the chapters from authority to adjustment, six chapters. St. Andrews and Golden is having their annual meeting today after the Sunday service. And um, they're going to have a little bite to eat and then I'll be joining them for the AGM. And then Windermere Valley is having their annual general meeting next Sunday after church and again it'll be in person or online. I like to say that annual general meetings are what we need to do to be an accountable charitable organization um, so they don't have to be long but it's a responsible thing for us to do. Nice in this picture to see the three buildings that are part of our pastoral charge down in Windermere Valley. Bring a lunch. Okay Greg says bring a lunch for next week. So this Tuesday, um, we're gonna have a Shrove Tuesday pancake supper in person in Invermere. Supper is from 5.30 to 6.30, it's $10 a person. Youth and children are free. And you know, you can try and you know, deke us out if you, you, know, um, you don't have the $10. And uh, we'd, anyway, we have, so far we have about 28 people coming in person, that's lovely. If you think you can come, uh, you can still let us know and we'll make sure there's enough food and uh, so it should be nice to, to gather in person but it's also online um, if you want to make pancakes where you are and join us uh, we're going to have a little program as well so uh, last couple of weeks we've read this out just read it again um, the Windermere Valley Shared Ministry Council is interested in the church looking into what it would mean to become an affirming pastoral charge this would mean being a part of a process where perhaps in the end we would be open and clear that we welcome all people especially people of various sexual and gender orientations in order to look into this we need to create an ad hoc committee if you feel called to be on this committee we have about four people already who would like to be on the committee um, but it, it could be it's very interesting and um, would provide good leadership in our church uh, can you please let someone from council or myself know in particular we're looking for someone who is willing to chair the committee and it's hard to proceed without a chair um, people are sort of willing to be on the committee but so far no one wants to chair it and uh, so i'd like to invite you to um, see if you feel called to do this uh, we, we do need some leadership around it. And um, so um, maybe you could say, why not me? <laughs> okay, we've been reading through the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
So today we read call number 38. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal youth in custody over the next decade. Call number 39, we call upon the federal government to develop a national plan to collect and publish data on the criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization. And lastly, call number 40, we call on all levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal people to create adequately funded and accessible Aboriginal specific victim and services with appropriate evaluation mechanisms. Good. Before I, I um, read this, I want to just note that Jennifer Kelly is uh, offering the children's time and the, the message today. Jennifer is uh, living in Calgary with Al and she teaches Indigenous Studies at the University of Calgary. Uh, we knew uh, Al and Jen, they were part of our church in Pincher Creek and we became friends and have always stayed in touch. And Al and Jen uh, regularly attend our church online. That's one of the reasons why we want to keep the hybrid going because we do have people like them who live a, out, out of the valley, but who attend. And uh, I really appreciate Jen being willing to share today. It, uh, it just always takes a lot from a person, you know, to put together a message and to wonder if they have the right message for the right people at the right time. And I, I appreciate Jen uh, taking a risk and sharing with us today. So thanks, Jen. We, uh, we acknowledge that we are on territory that was occupied by Indigenous people for many, many years. And that we understand in part that how things changed had to do with colonization, where there was a, an unfair and unrespectful differential of power. And um, we are the beneficiaries and recipients from that history. And we seek to be aware of it and now live in right relations with Indigenous people where we are. And I invite us, as we do so much thinking and live in our minds so much of our time, just to step out of our thoughts and out of our minds into the present moment. And let's say together the line from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Today in the church year is called Transfiguration Sunday. Today is the last Sunday of the season after Epiphany. Next Sunday, the season of Lent begins. Always on this Sunday, before Lent begins, the lectionary offers the gospel story of the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain alongside Moses and Elijah. Moses is seen as the great liberator and lawgiver. Elijah is seen as a great prophet. Jesus is in good company with these two. The story conveys the meaning that Jesus is the new liberator, a teacher a new teacher on how people are to live, and a prophet who will courageously speak for God's way in a world where injustice and cruelty can occur. Jennifer Kelly is going to share her reflections as a facilitator and companion of Indigenous matters. Our desire to expand our understandings, to seek liberation, to live in right relations, continues. Our opening hymn is a Dakota hymn with um, Dakota melody, and uh, it has a history behind it. But uh, let's uh, enjoy singing Many and Great, O God Are Your Works, number 308 in Voices United. Spread the mountains and plains. 
please have a seat. And our words of wisdom today uh, come from Steve Taylor, uh, who writes beautiful spiritual reflections. And this is from his book, The Clear Light. There's so much messiness to rise above, the discord of relationships, the pettiness of resentment and jealousy and the frustrations of illness and tiredness. There's so much triviality to rise above, the drudgery of chores and draining demands, the endless juggling of arrangements and deadlines, the constant nagging needs of the body and mind. There's so much meanness to rise above, the inner lack that makes us hunger for power and possessions, and the ego separateness that makes us numb to the sufferings of others. That's why we have to find a purpose that lifts us above the messiness. That's why we have to find a meaning that immunizes us to the pettiness. That's why we have to reach a place of pure and timeless truth, where wisdom is waiting to be expressed and embodied and transmitted to future generations. Every act of selflessness is a triumph of unity over separateness. Every artistic creation is a triumph of truth over triviality. And then, once we've risen above, we have to come back down again to share our truth and insight. We have to illuminate the world below with the light we've gathered from above. Then the world will be transfigured. The mundane will be touched with the miraculous. And discord will be filled with harmony. Words of wisdom for us today. Oh, a story time. And I see a picture of a duck and a picture of Benny the bear. So let's see what happens. Okay. Can everyone, can everyone hear Ducky okay? Yeah, yes. we can hear Ducky, but no Benny. Ducky's pretty excited to be seeing Benny again. It's been a while. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm so excited. Good to see you. Can you hear me? Hey. I was trying to remove the spotlight from Bryn. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great to see you, Benny. Brent, can you take the spotlight off your? Oh, there he did it. Someone did it. Hey, yeah. Nice to see you, Ducky. And hi, Jen. Hi. So well, I don't know if everybody knows that you and Ducky have been friends for a really long time since you were a little yeah. duckling, since you were a cub. And yeah. pretty I'm... much every. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, you go. I'm I'm bad at interrupting. No. <laughs> That's okay. You you can talk as much as you want today. That's just fine with me. Um, but I just wanted to let everybody know that you two have been really good friends for a long time. And yeah. yep, and you we've had summer holidays together since you were a duckling and a cub, right? Yeah. Well, I heard about Ducky, but I didn't know it was this Ducky, and I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, you, hopefully you'll see each other soon. Yeah. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit today about a time when we were on all on holiday together. And I don't, I hope you remember this. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. But it was a time when you two were playing a game. I think the rest of us, like we were making supper or something, you two were playing a game. And there was laughing and giggling. And then the sound started to change and then we kind of heard like grumpy quacks and we heard some growls and the yeah. next thing you knew ducky was like flying off and went for a long swim and you 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 climbed up a tree and and stayed there for a while to something had happened 
and yeah. the game wasn't going very well, and you no. got mad at each other. Yeah, and I'm sorry about that, Ducky. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember what happened next? Do you, Ducky? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember it quite like that, Ducky. I remember a little different. <laughs> well, what Ducky says is that uh, Ducky remembers that that. Ducky just missed you so much and realized that it was just a silly game and came and found you and called you down from the tree and said, yeah. I'm really, really sorry and I miss you. And you two talked about it for a while and it was really neat to see because you sat down and you had a chat and you yeah. said sorry and then you both kind of went, that game was pretty silly. That's not a good game. Because yeah. you know what? It's making us upset. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of embarrassed about that now. But it happens, doesn't it? You know what? It happens a lot. And you know what? One of one of our kids said to us is, you know that game Monopoly? I don't think you were playing Monopoly, but that game Monopoly, it's kind of designed to make people upset. When kids play that game, Right. Nobody's nobody happy by the end of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, sometimes it's just what, it's just the game, right? So right. I was really proud and impressed by both of you because what you uh -huh. did. Yeah. yeah you good remember? work, Ducky. Good work, Ducky. Yeah. Yeah. So you two sat down together and you made up a brand new game. Yeah. And you made up new rules that you both agreed on. Yeah, and you had great fun. Now I don't remember what you called the game. I don't know. Do you remember? Cooperation is the game. That's yeah. the game. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> but yeah. whatever it is, you've been playing it ever since. Yeah. And sometimes you you make it easier, and sometimes you add some things, but you always make sure that the two of you are having fun, and that you agree on how yeah. you're going to do things. Yeah, yeah. I think we should call it. Ducky and Benny together, fun! I think so, I think so. And I think lots of us adults could learn from the two of you, because sometimes we get very stuck with, well, these are the rules and this is how you have to do it. And that that doesn't help our friendship sometimes and that doesn't help our relationship. No, it's not just games that we get stuck on the rules, is it? Like yeah, we exactly. life into a game, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, so nice to see you, too. Yeah, let's get together this summer. Absolutely, absolutely. Because that's what friends do. We all, and, and that's why it makes it easier when we have these little bumps in the road because we know that we're friends or we're in relationship forever. Yeah, so we know that we're going to have these little moments, but that it'll be okay in the end if we talk about it. Great. Thanks for sharing and reminding me. Well, it's good to see you again. Bye. 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 Great, great message, you three. Thank you so much. I like it. I just don't know if I like how I handle technology. Okay. I believe. I almost believe everything's working. And so we have this lovely hymn, 135 and more voices called by earth and sky. If you, wherever you are, if you wanna stand, you can stand. If you wanna stay seated, please stay seated and let's enjoy called by earth and sky.
gracious, this gives the air we breathe, wind born and free, breath of the Spirit blow through this place, our gathering and our grace. Call by earth and sky, promise of Thank you, Lisa. Beautiful words, beautiful pictures in the background. Judy, thank you for reading our scripture today. Judy's in person. <laughs> Hi, Judy. I forgot I saw you earlier. All right. Wonderful. And, and you know the arrow. The first reading today is Exodus 24, 12 to 18. Today, both readings have to do with encountering God on top of a mountain. Both have to do with a glorious experience, a sacred encounter and transformation. Often a significant religious or spiritual experience is said to have happened on top of a mountain or beside a body of water. Okay, it's not going down. Let's give her a little bump here. Okay, try it now. Thank you. The two stories of today may not have literally happened as they are recorded, but they are artistic portrayals conveying the message that important leaders are part of a divine will and way. From Exodus 24. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you, whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. 
second reading from Matthew 17. This is the story of the transfiguration, which is customarily read the Sunday before Lent begins. The word transfigured in verse two translates the Greek verb metamorpho, which suggests changes deep within a person. This is my son, the beloved, is the same affirmation that Jesus heard at his baptism. This time the voice comes from the cloud, adds a command. <clears throat> the voice from the cloud adds a command, listen to him. Perhaps this is written to be a message to all followers to truly travel the way of transformation and metamorphosis. If it is your tradition to stand for the gospel reading, please feel free to stand. From Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased listen to him when the disciples heard this they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear but jesus came and touched them saying get up and do not be afraid and when they looked up they saw no one except jesus himself alone as they were coming down the mountain jesus ordered them tell no one about the vision until after the son of man has been raised from the dead May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Okay. So a message by Jen Kelly, the longest journey is from your head to your heart. I'm just going to do a little technical things here before you begin, Jen. Um, again, Thank you so much for who you are and the I, long uh, time it, that know. you've been in relationship I with indigenous and non-indigenous people talking about um, matters. Uh, and it's very rich for us to have you speak today. So I think we're ready to turn it over to you, Jen. Okay, uh, thank you, Brent. Uh, first of all, is my volume okay? All of the tech things are okay? Okay. Um, well, thanks everyone for um, being here today and Brent um, for the invitation to be here. And I'm sorry, I just, my own giant face just popped up on the screen. <laughs> and so I'm gonna try and do something about that. Um, not sure if I can, but anyway. Okay, you can still see me okay? Yes? Could someone yes. tell yes. me if you can see me okay? Yes, we can see you. Okay, great. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, it, up until now, I know that you haven't um, known me. Um, you know my partner, Al, and you've also known Ducky. Um, I have been attending service, um, though I'm typically like on my own laptop without the camera on. Um, so, so that's why I get a little freaked out about thinking about my, my, my giant face on screen, on screen for some of you. So I'll try not to think about that. Um, yeah, in previous weeks, um, Brent has introduced me as someone who teaches um, in Indigenous Studies at the University of Calgary, which is true. Um, my official title is instructor. Um, but I don't consider myself a teacher as much as a facilitator and really a lifelong learner. Um, so to introduce myself a bit further, um, I was born and raised on Amgenong territory. It's Amgenobek territory, uh, Treaty 29 in what is now Southwestern Ontario. I'm at least sixth, maybe seventh generation um, white settler Canadian with Irish, French and English ancestry. 
have lived on Treaty 7 territory since 1993. And I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from Mokinsis, which is the Blackfoot word for um, where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, also known as Calgary. Uh, Treaty 7 territory is the traditional home of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And that's comprised of the Gaina, the Pikani, the Siksika First Nations, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda, comprising the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. And Treaty 7 territory is also home to Metis Nation Region 3. It's also the territory on which our two children were born, where I've fallen in love with the mountains and with the prairie sunshine. And when they don't give me migraines, the Chinooks as well. So in terms of my own journey um, of learning, um, learning to become a good relative is how I'm going to phrase it. I was 20 years old in university when I first learned about residential schools in Canada. And that was way back in 1983, kind of shocks me how long ago that was now. Um, and when I first learned and heard about this history, I was shocked and I was furious. And I was also really, really confused. I couldn't understand why I didn't know any of this. I didn't know the truth about what happened right on the land that I was raised on. And I wanted to know how this not knowing process happens. I just didn't understand. And so that's when my journey for me really began. And I think continuing my journey, I think one of the things that often challenges me and I think challenges a lot of us um, is that this accurate history um, somehow challenges our sense of ourselves, our sense of our identity or our place in Canada or this, this idea that we had about Canada and our relationship to it. Um, and, oh, I can hear myself echoing. I hope that's okay. Um, so yeah, so today what I would like to do is share a little bit about what I've been learning about what it means to be a good relative. And the term and concept of good relative are quite new to me and um, yet I'm really quite excited about it. It's a way of conceptualizing from an Indigenous perspective, um, the relationship of non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples. And it's, it's part of um, thinking about how to engage in processes of truth and reconciliation, um, anti-racism work. You might be familiar with the term uh, white ally and in some ways being a good relative is, is very similar. And then in other ways, it's quite particular. It's very culturally specific. And for me, as I'm learning about it, it's really quite profound and transformative for me. So um, as I tried to share in my conversation with Benny and Ducky, um, being a good relative, as I understand it, means knowing that we are already in relationship with Indigenous people, whether we know Indigenous people um, individually, personally, or not, um, that relationship is always there. And when I begin with the knowing that I'm already a relative, um, always was, always will be, um, was always seen as one, even if I've been seen as the crazy aunt, I'm still a relative, right? Something about that for me shifts me away from kind of the us versus them thinking that I think dominates a lot of our conversations sometimes. Um, and, and so for me, um, the concept and, and idea of being a good relative is hopeful. So I'm going to try to make some connections between what I'm learning and my wrestling with this passage from Matthew because um, the story I thought was really familiar to me and yet I see it very, very differently now than I used to. And I did not expect a Bible passage to have this kind of effect on me, but my wrestling with it this week has helped me on my journey of trying to be a good relative. So please bear with me as I try to connect a bunch of dots, which in many ways at first seem really disconnected, but they're, they're connected in my brain, believe me. <laughs> so, 
When I returned to this story this week, I was struck and surprised by a couple of things. One of them was I was really taken by Peter's initial reaction. So when he and James and John see Jesus and Moses and Elijah up there on the mountaintop, Peter's first reaction is basically like, hey, this is amazing. I propose we stay up here. It's beautiful here, all of us together. I'll make tents for everybody. We can stay up here as long as we want. This is great. Um, I didn't originally recall this part of the story, but now part of me gets it. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to stay there too. Yeah, it sounds pretty amazing. The second thing that struck me, I'm gonna say might sound a little weird. It really is weird. Um, so anyway, stick with me. Um, the passage says, a change came over Jesus. His face was shining like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white. Now, the past, that's not the weird part. I'm familiar with the story and I'm familiar with that, that image. We've seen it often enough, right? Um, the strange part for me is that after I read that passage, I found myself, the first question that came into my head is, well, when did Jesus stop shining? When did his skin return to its regular tone? Was it after Jesus touched his disciples and said, well, don't be afraid? Was it on the trek down the mountain? As they walked down the trail, did he like gradually turn, um, did he gradually like stop shining and his clothes kind of turn to their regular maybe beige color? Um, so everything was back to normal by the time they reached the bottom. And then kind of why doesn't the passage say anything about when he stopped shining? So weird questions, right? I mean, I was pretty surprised by that, though those questions came up. Of all possible responses, that's what popped into my head. And it's a fairly literal kind of question. And I don't read the Bible literally. I read it as a human text with profound wisdom. Um, so I've been asking myself, why did I ask these questions? Where did they come from? What does that have to do with me being a good relative? Um, does it at all, right? And should I even, should I even mention it to you? Because it just feels a little weird. Um, but I am going to try and make a connection. Okay. When I first learned about residential schools, literally 40 years ago, I think a large part of my initial response was focused on the necessity of getting the truth out there. Right? I didn't want more generations of non-Indigenous Canadians to grow up the way I did with the not knowing. So <clears throat> in retrospect, I realized that I, I thought that would be enough. I thought that if we just got the accurate information out there, things would automatically change. And it isn't automatic. Something I'm hearing consistently from Indigenous knowledge keepers is that there cannot be reconciliation without truth. And that non-Indigenous people seem to want to jump ahead to reconciliation without always grappling with the truth. And to me, grappling with the truth will not lead to reconciliation unless there's also truth listening. And by truth listening, I mean listening with our hearts and not only with our heads. Yes, we need accurate information, but even with this information, our heads can go so quickly to the familiar narratives that are so familiar that they take on their own aura of like authority and truth. <clears throat> Sometimes we go to the familiar so quickly, we don't even hear what actually is being said. And that's true for me as well, um, because it's so automatic. So we're not really truth listening. And a couple of examples come to mind. And before I, would, like, before I mention them, I'd like to stress that I have felt these myself. This is part of my journey too. Um, one of these responses that we hear fairly often is, I don't want to be blamed for the faults of my ancestors. But here's the thing, I've been engaging in this work for 40 years. I've worked with probably hundreds, if not more of indigenous people. I've read the published works of indigenous writers and academics and activists, I follow the news. And not once 
have I personally or in any of those forums actually literally been told that I am responsible for my ancestors' actions? Not once. I've heard repeated requests for recognition that the past has created inequality. I've heard requests for support. I've heard requests that we please not look away from people traumatized by the past. But collectively, we seem to hear blame. And it's amazing how automatic that response is. So we're not truth listening. It's kind of like my question about when does Jesus stop shining? Um, it's a bit of a superficial question, I know. But thinking about the initial response to the Matthew passage has been really instructive for me. I'm trained in literary analysis and I've worked as a professional editor and my mini obsession with this textual detail has reminded me how easy and automatic it is for my thinking to enter a particular groove and stay there and essentially miss the point. So to me, upon reflection, the point maybe is that in the passage, Jesus never stopped glowing. Maybe he never started shining. Maybe the point is that Jesus didn't really change at all. But Peter and James and John finally saw what was in front of them all along. The divine nature of Jesus, if that's what you want to call it. Maybe the point of the story for me is that they are seeing in a new way. And maybe Jesus knew they just needed a bit of a nudge to see differently. And what better way to clear your friends' heads than invite them up for a trek up the mountain, you know, enjoy the view, right? So this resonates with my experience of learning and unlearning and aspiring to be a good relative. I'm not there yet, for sure. Being a good relative is really it's something that's conferred. It's not something I proclaim upon myself. <laughs> it would be something that I would be, I would earn um, um, to be called that. But I definitely am seeing differently than I once did. And I am being differently in the world because of what I've learned, because um, of how I feel now. And I'm not sure when it happened. It wasn't a miracle on a mountaintop. It was more like a series of steps and missteps. But the result for me has been really profound. I finally realized that despite all of my angst about being a white person and being terrified of saying the wrong thing and of making, mistake, making mistakes and hurting others because I just didn't know and I didn't understand. And yes, I've made many of those. Um, but despite all that, I was being seen differently than I saw myself. I wasn't being seen as one person on one side of an us versus them conflict. I was seen as a relative, as a person first with faults and foibles and strengths and part and seen as part and accepted as a part of a much bigger us, if that makes sense. So it wasn't so much my skin that was being seen, though of course I always do try to be aware of my white privilege and racism is all too real. But my heart was also being seen and felt as well. And as soon as I realized this, like really realized it in my heart, in my being, um, I found myself thinking and feeling and being quite differently a lot of the mental noise went away and I could hear my heart more clearly and what it often says is very different from what's going on up here. When I think of my own extended family and my neighborhood and my social network and the families of my friends, I don't have to go very far to find stories of individuals who are grappling with addiction, mental illness, the whole range of things. I don't think I'm alone in this. And I believe that for all of us today, when we think of our family members hurting and struggling, I believe our first instinct is to respond with our hearts. We hurt for them and we hurt for the people who love them. We heart listen. 
we don't debate the accuracy of their struggle. So when I hear white Canadians in positions of power insist that there had to be something positive about residential schools, and I hear arguments that people should be allowed to make these statements for the sake of free speech and open debate, I wonder why more people aren't concerned about these, how these claims re-traumatize the survivors whose truth is being denied and how having to retell their truths to people who don't want to hear it is yet another form of re-traumatizing. How that must hurt. And I wonder why there is this apparent need to hear something good about something that really was not. Um, why is that automatic response there? Is it supportive of relationship? And when we go to those places, I think we're not listening with our hearts because you don't do that to your relatives, right? When, you're, when they're hurting, you don't do that. So to return to the Bible story, I feel this story from Matthew reminds me to question the automatic, but also to trust my heart. I believe settler Canadians care. I believe that when we hear the stories about children wrenched from their homes and their families, that our hearts ache for them, for the children, for the parents, for the communities still trying to recover. And sometimes we don't know what to say. And sometimes, you know, after all these years, for me, it feels really huge and overwhelming. And I sometimes don't know what to say or where to start, what I can do. But in my experience, beginning with, I don't know what to say, but my heart hurts for you, goes a long way. So each of us, I think, will find our way to reconciliation. And I think as a country, we will, because we do care. And when the heart is the guiding principle, I think the rest will follow. Missteps, mistakes, and all. So finally, I'd like to return to Peter's desire to stay up on that mountain uh, where it's safe and everyone's in agreement and the view is amazing. Um, I get that wanting to stay there. I want to stay there with people that always agree with me. <laughs> Great. Um, but the work and the wonder of being part of a family, of being in relationship and being a, in a relative, uh, being a relative is a lot messier than that. But when I think about it for myself, my most important relationships, the ones I hold closest to my heart are also the ones that are the hardest that I feel the deepest, that make me the craziest, um, that are also the most wonderful. In the text, Jesus says they have to leave the mountaintop. And I take this to say they have to go back to the messiness of everyday living. And Peter and James and John are not yet to speak of what they have learned. But the disciples don't return unchanged, at least not to me. Even if they don't say a word about what happened on the mountaintop, they see the world differently, they act accordingly. Jesus might be shining or not, that's not the point. The point is that they know the world differently now, they can't not. And now that I know, I really know that I'm a relative, I am different in the world. I am part of something bigger and I aspire to be considered a good relative. Thank you for listening. Jen, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Um, hey, um, that was great. Um, today um, is Transfiguration Sunday, which is such a close word to transformation. And I mean, I really appreciate 
people who are part of church life that we almost dare to come to church and be encountered with biblical stories and encounter biblical stories in such a way as we sort of delve into them that they might change us. And then to encounter you and you help us because your encounter with indigenous people and your own self and the processing that you've been about. Um, Let me go back. Hopefully, can you hear me now again? Okay. Yeah, it's the kind of thing um, that begins to change us and transform us. I, uh, I so appreciated what you shared today and how you shared it. And um, I like this thing about a good relative. And I, if I heard you correctly, for us to have a sense that Indigenous people see us as relatives, um, and that's a good thing. We're not the outsider or something. We're part of the family and we're relatives and, and so on. Uh, when we, you and I were talking this week, you said something about they, they might even see you as the crazy aunt, um, but that was okay and because you're still a relative. And, um, and then and with that, there's almost a sense of commitment and care for each other as we're on this journey together. I really um, am glad that you're in our lives and in our church life, and you're a resource for us. Uh, I'm sure there's people that might want to talk with you and process, because all of us um, are trying to figure out our thoughts about this. And it's so nice that we have you to maybe talk with and, uh, and then hear from you again on another time too. Anyway, and then after church, even today, maybe there'd be a few minutes if people have questions or comments that they can, can share. <laughs> So I guess uh, we'll we'll carry on, um, and thank you so much, Jen. the The hymn that we chose for following <laughs> for following the message, "Would you bless our homes and families?" It was sort of in line with this idea that we are um, in family relationships with each other, and of course, it's Family Day weekend, and. Now I'm going to go to a different sound system. <laughs> and uh, let's enjoy singing, Would You Bless Our Homes and Families? Would you bless our homes and families, source of life who calls us here in our world of stress and tension, teach us love
Ah, beautiful hymn. And here comes Tess, who's going to lead us in our prayer time. Hi, Tess. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come with much to be thankful for. We have heard the gospel message of Jesus going up on the mountain. We live surrounded by mountains and understand their grandeur in your creation. We give thanks for the gift of your son Jesus, who shows us your love in his actions, your grace in his manner of being. Together, we are a people of diverse spiritual expressions and indigenous traditions who invoke you by different names. Humbly pray that you give us the opportunity to encounter each other, to reach mutual respect and reciprocal acceptance of each other. We ask for your love upon our hearts as we celebrate this Family Day weekend. We give thanks for a healing art installation, the witness blanket in Regina. May this artistic creation be a triumph of truth over triviality. May healing and understanding come that your love for all will be heartfelt and we will come to fully embrace our diversity in your creation. We often find ourselves weary, tired out by a load of care, a heap of responsibility and concern. We hunger and thirst. We may be frustrated by illness, demands upon us that are weighing heavy on our hearts. We ask that we be filled with your spirit, refresh us and make us new. Today, we pray for Cheryl, Robin, Cliff, and for all those now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. May we be granted health and wholeness, peace and joy, strength and hope. We ask for your loving guidance on those who give care with dedication to those in need. We continue to receive news of devastation in your creation from floods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. May your presence be felt by all who work to bring aid and by those who are impacted by forces beyond their control. May we be shown a path that will show us how to have trust in one another. In your world, conflicts continue and many are displaced. We pray for the leaders that they may feel your guidance. May your guidance show us how, with your love, we are able to extend a source of hope to everyone impacted by these conflicts. May the world leaders be shown the way to harmony and unity. May we understand and respond to your wisdom to have us listen, to marvel, and to see a way that lights our way. We ask that your creation, your world, be transfigured, that all may be made new and whole. Let us walk in your light. Loving God, we pray that your glory may give to your people everywhere the energy to shine wherever there is darkness, disunity, persecution, or despair. Amen. Yes, those words are so beautiful and thoughtfully and prayerfully written and, and given. Beautiful, thank you. Our closing hymn is Spirit Open My Heart. Spirit open my heart to the joy receiving 
story in each thought, word, and deed. May my living bring you glory, Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love, may I love in receiving and in giving, Spirit, beautiful hymn and it's uh, of course it's a prayer it's written as a prayer and fits so meaningfully with what Jen was sharing today our blessing and benediction transfiguration transformation metamorphosis change moving from one state to another changing from one degree of glory to another this is what's offered this is what's needed this is what we can allow. This is what we can participate in. This is what we can enjoy. Let us embrace the process of transfiguration, expanding, growing, becoming, being. It is God's good work in us. Amen. <laughs>